Hello and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Stephen Kotler is the Executive Director at the Flow Research Collective. He is a New York Times bestselling author and an award-winning journalist. He is one of the world's leading experts on high performance. He is the author of several bestsellers, including The Rise of Superman, Tomorrowland, Bold, West of Jesus, and Abundance. Two of his books, A Small Furry Prayer and Stealing Fire, were nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. His latest book is called The Art of Impossible, A Peak Performance Primer. His writing has been translated into over 40 languages and appeared in over 100 publications, including the New York Times, Atlantic Monthly, Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Wired, and Time. Stephen is also the co-founder of Creating Equilibrium, focused on solving critical environmental changes, and alongside his wife, author Joy Nicholson, is the co-founder of Rancho de Chihuahua, a hospice and special needs care dog sanctuary in the mountains of northern New Mexico. He has a bachelor's from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a master's from John Hopkins University. And you can, wear, you can definitely find him hurtling himself down mountains at high speeds. <laughs> Stephen Cutler, what an honor to welcome you to Boundless Body Radio. Good to be with you. Absolutely. You've been described as a gravity lover. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I'm just an action sport athlete. Um, I, uh, I tend to like to go down at speed. And when that happens, uh, that's, there's usually gravity involved. Mountain bikes, skis, you know, even surfing is a, is a gravity sport in, uh, of sorts. So I'm a big fan of action sports. Sure. Oh, that's awesome. And you live in uh, Tahoe, is that right? So you get to ski quite I a do. bit. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. Um, like I said, we're so honored to have you on our show. You've done such a wide array of different things. I definitely want to talk about your new book. But before we do, I want to talk about your primary research. And I want to just quickly describe a scenario. And you can tell me what the hell is going on in this scenario. Um, at six in the morning, I feel like my my defensive partner, Andrew, has already gone to the bench after he clears the puck down the ice. And so he kind of leaves me high and dry. I make a note in my head to give him shit when I get back on the bench. Ben gets the puck on the opposite team and passes it towards Justin. I realize I have to turn 180 degrees, skate backwards to be able to take away the middle because I feel Bobby, also on their team, coming down the left. Justin rifles the puck around the net, and I realize that I can beat Bobby even though he's a little faster than me if I just turn another 180 degrees degrees and sprint towards the puck. As I do, I see Tyler up the ice. I get to the puck first, beating Bobby, and flip the puck up the glass over to Tyler, who takes it down and scores. All of this happens at six in the morning in about 10 seconds. What the hell just happened? Couple of questions. First of all, when we talk about puck, we're not talking about a Shakespearean character, correct? <laughs> correct. Okay. I just wanted to start there. Well, I mean, clearly what happened is you scored a touchdown. Of course. <laughs> um, I have, uh, so you play ice hockey at six o'clock in the morning? Yep, that's right. It's just amazing. I got back to the bench and gave Andrew a bunch of shit, but you, you sit down and you realize, like, how did, how did all of that complexity transpire in such a quick amount of time? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really, um, it's fun when you get to see the speed of the uh, unconscious mind at work that happens a lot in flow. It happens with these these automated processes, right? Where we're layering so much complication on top of so much complication. And if you just stop to consider the computational power that goes into making those decisions at the speed you're making them, it's pretty astounding. Yeah, that's, it's pretty remarkable to look back and, you know, kind of contemplate what, it, what it's like to get in that type of state. I'm really curious. Can you tell the listener a little bit about the type of work that you do at the Flow Collective? The Flow Research Collective. So we are focused on the neurobiology of peak human performance. Now, at the center of our work is the state of consciousness, the state of optimal performance known as flow, but there's more going on. And um, you know, really our focus is what's going on in the brain and the body when people are performing at their very best. And uh, we're a research and training organization. So on the research side, we're partnered with folks, neuroscientists at USC, at Stanford, at uh, Imperial College, London, and a couple other places. And, you know, we're, we're, we actively research flow in the neurobiology of peak human performance. And then uh, on the training side, we work with everybody from professional athletes and U.S. Special Forces all the way through uh, C-suite executives at, at Fortune 500 companies, all the way through whole companies, uh, and then to the general public. And 
you know, we, I think we work with people in 44 different countries. So this is like soccer moms in Indiana and real estate brokers in Dubai and coders in Delhi. Right. And, um, it's about a thousand people a month. And I think the reason that matters to anybody who's listening to this is it gives us a great, we measure everything. So we have a really good data set on what works and, and, and what doesn't. And so we do the science research on the front end, and then we do the applied neuroscience on the back end, and we data gather throughout. Mm. What are some of the practical things that you've learned about the flow state as the years have gone on? In a sense, it's worth like doing this historically, uh, just because it's it's probably faster. Flow science itself is like oh, dates back to the 1870s, so it's um, 150 years old. Most of the work that got done up through the 70s, 80s, and into the early 90s is when I first came into the field was in the psychology of flow. And uh, we've gotten a really, really kind of good understanding of how flow functions psychologically. Um, from the 90s forward, there were two core questions. What, if we're talking about optimal performance, how optimal, what are we talking about? So there's been you know, 30 years of research into flows, impact on motivation, productivity, grit, learning, creativity, collaboration, cooperation, and a bunch of other things that it amplifies. So that uh, is is stuff that has been learned. And the bulk of my work, which has been on the neurobiology of flow, what's going on in a kind of mechanistic brain level, that uh, when we're in the state and and, and to produce the state, that's been my work, and that's been kind of the work of a bunch of different people in the field. There are probably, I would guess, a thousand different flow researchers in the world at this point. So it's a pretty a substantial field at this point. And uh, this is, and we've made great progress using uh, neuroscience to kind of tease back what is causing flow, what's going on in the brain when we're in this state, what's going on in the body when we're in the state, how do we get more of it in our lives, and that sort of thing. So all of those things have changed. The most recent and the and this and the most practical and the most useful and you know the stuff that most people care about is over the past 10 to 15 years, a lot of our focus uh, as a field has been on so-called flow triggers, preconditions that lead to more flow. Oh, and 22, possibly 23, because there was just a new discovery made a couple of weeks ago. Um, different flow triggers have been, have been found. There's probably way more, but that's what we know so far. And if you're interested in spending more time in flow and really optimizing performance, these triggers are your toolkit. So that's the stuff that I'm most excited about. Interesting. You mentioned such a diverse group of people that you work with. Do you do you find that everybody has access to flow whenever they like, or do they they need to be properly trained with those triggers that you mentioned? So a couple of things that are extremely well known about flow. Everybody, it's it's universal in humans. It's actually universal in most mammals. Um, but in it, any you all humans can get into flow. So everybody listening to me right now can can drop into flow. Uh, it's ubiquitous, but the, the catch is provided certain initial conditions are met. And those are usually, usually you're talking about flow triggers. Sometimes uh, one of the things that people, uh, one of the mistakes that people make about flow, about being in the zone is they think it's a binary, like a light switch. You're either in the zone or out of the zone and it doesn't actually work that way. It's a four stage process. And to get back into flow, to maximize the amount of time we spend in flow in our lives, you have to kind of know how to move through all four stages of the process. So the two things together, how do the triggers work and how does the flow cycle work? Um, so your map and your toolkit, those are the those are the really big levers. And just to put it in context with you, so you can go back in the 1990s when people were trying to train flow using the psychology um, most, a lot of that work got documented in a great book by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the godfather of flow psychology and a woman named Susan Jackson, who's a sports psychologist and a positive psychologist and uh, a very high level, uh, I, I believe it was Olympic level athlete, co- uh, athletes that she was working with and definitely college athletes. So she's a coach as well. And they wrote a book called flow in sports. And, you know, how do we use the psychology that we know about flow to drop people into flow? And you can read the book and you can figure out that like most of the time they missed it was not their their hit rate was lousy, and yet we use the exact same measurement tool. In fact, we use a measurement tool designed by Susan Jackson and, and me had check sent me high to measure flow, 
And we see on average using kind of the neuroscience of how these triggers works and how the cycle works, a 70 to 80% boost in, in flow in our clients. So it's very, very, very trainable and is very, very accessible to everybody on earth. Here's the final caveat, the final answer to your question. Which triggers are going to be most useful for you depend on a whole ton of very individual unique factors, stuff about your personality, who you are in the world, the energy levels and you have in a given day, how much fear you're bringing to the task at hand, your cultural backgrounds, ability to delay gratification, a bunch of other stuff like that all sort of go into like what triggers should you reach for right here, right now. So the triggers work for everybody because it's neurobiology, but which ones are going to be applicable for you in this situation? That's very individual. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. It's, it's super fascinating. It's so cool that you guys were able to, you know, push the ball down the field with some of this research in, in the art of impossible, your last book, you talk a lot about motivation as kind of the starting point for that process. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So let me give you uh, let me pull back for half a second and uh, talk about the thinking that led to art and the impossible. Cause we're right there. and It'll help. So one of the things that we saw in clients using kind of neuroscience to train them is, wow, you can get this enormous increase in flow. Amazing. It's not stable. It goes way up. And then most people, not everybody, most people come crashing way back down. And we started asking ourselves, well, why is that? What's going on? And it turns out flow is one quarter of the peak performance picture. If you really want to talk about kind of peak human performance, you're really talking about four categories of skill sets. The first of these is motivation. The second is learning. The third is creativity. And the fourth is flow. We've been talking about flow triggers and the flow cycle and a little bit about flow. That's all stuff that would fit under the heading of flow, right? There's a similar bunch of stuff under motivation, learning, and creativity. And the way I kind of put all these things together is they're a system. They were designed to work together, to work in a specific order. And the way I think about it is when you face any challenge, motivation gets you into the game. Learning allows you to keep on playing. Creativity is how we steer and flow is how we amplify the results. And that's sort of, especially from like the standpoint of cognitive peak performance, that's the toolkit. And the science shows that if you're interested in training peak performance, while you can start in any order, you can go in any which way, it doesn't, you're still going to see results if you want to get get farther, faster, with just a lot less fuss, there's an order because it's the order the system is sort of designed to come online with. And it starts with motivation. And when psychologists and scientists say motivation, I said it's a catch-all term for a bunch of skill sets. It's really a combination of extrinsic motivation, stuff in the real world will work really hard to get money, sex, fame, uh, intrinsic motivation motivation. And there are tons of intrinsic motivators. These are just the, our internal psychological drivers, but there are big five, which are curiosity, passion, purpose, autonomy, and mastery. And finally, there's th goals and grit. And there's what the science shows is there's three levels of goals that humans need to set to function sort of at the best and six levels of grit we should train. So when we talk about motivation, we're talking about, you know, these four sets of skills, Skills. And it's a big deal because motivation is energy for action, right? It's how we get off the couch and get into the game and rise the challenge and all that. And in peak performance, peak performance by definition is essentially a long haul, right? You're in it. Peak performance is like compound interest. It's just stuff you do every day and the next 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 day. And you know, that's, that's, it's really in a sense, all that's going on. Some of this stuff has to do with motivation. And if you want to maximize motivation, there's an order to it. You want to start with extrinsic, move through the intrinsic motivators, move into goal setting and move into grit. I'll stop there. We can go deeper in any direction you want, but you, I, that's sort of the high level overview. No, it's going to be talking. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, I never thought of it in that way. It makes a lot of sense now, but you do such a great job of d describing in the book, like you can't worry so much about your intrinsic motivations until your external is taken care of to a certain extent. Is that right? Yeah, it's that's this is one of the strongest findings. And it's, um, it's a challenging one, because it's the science shows that 
it, I mean, very simply, you got to be able to get into flow to perform at your best. And if there's too much fear in the system, you can't get into flow. You also have to be able to learn to perform at your best. If there's too much fear in the system, it blocks learning. You also need to be able to make creative decisions to be able to perform at your best. When there's too much fear in the system, we can't do that either. And so the research shows, look, we got to start by dealing with basic survival needs. You got to start with income. And this is Daniel Kahneman's work. You need to make enough money to basically pay all your bills and have a little leftover for fun. And it's really just a little leftover for fun. The problem is that if you're, you know, if you're food insecure, if you don't know how you're going to make rent, how you're going to feed your family or pay your mortgage or any of those concerns, the fear load is so great. It's just going to block everything else. So the research shows, hey, just start there. Start by solving the extrinsic. That's the first place to go. And, you know, from, once that's taken care of and you've got a little less over, this doesn't mean, of course, that you stop wanting things in the real world, right? You may have you may have an apartment and be making enough money to pay your bills, but you may want to start a family or, you know, buy a house or all that. Like, you're still going to want other things. But what we found, what the research shows is that from that point on, if you significantly want to enhance motivation, extrinsic goals, once the safety and security stuff is sort of dialed back, back a little, we start wanting intrinsic drivers, intrinsic motivators. And the, the, the thing to think about here, just from, a, from just a higher level standpoint, is if you're an athlete, right, you go play hockey at six o'clock in the morning, you know that if you want to perform well on the ice, you got seven, eight hours of sleep a night. You ate a really healthy breakfast. You got the right amount of fats, proteins, carbs, and proper hydration, right? You want to stack as many possible fuel sources, right? Physical body energy fuel sources on top of one another as you possibly can before you hit the ice. We all know that. That's common sense to most of us. What we don't often realize is the same thing is true with our intrinsic motivators, right? The things that fuel the mind. And as I said earlier, there are five big ones, curiosity, passion, purpose, autonomy, mastery. As you pointed out, there one is designed to be turned into the next, into the next, into the next, into the next. It's how the system sort of design, is designed to come online just normally evolutionarily and through normal kind of childhood and adult development. Um, and so by doing it in that order, you're just sort of you using our biology for our benefit. And I've always said that I, peak performance is nothing more than getting our biology to work for us rather than against us. It's nothing fancier than that. Mm. Yeah, I love that. I love that you make that such a point. You do a great job of telling us practical examples of how to find our own individual um, motivators, intrinsic motivations. Can you describe that process a little bit? Well, if you if anybody wants the whole process, go to the passionrecipe.com because we turned it into kind of like a tutorial with a little bit of an interactive workbook thing because so many people asked. Um, or you uh, or you can read the art of impossible and it's all there. But the simple idea is that the most foundational intrinsic motivator is curiosity. Why does that what does an intrinsic motivator matter? What's the big deal here? The brain is an energy hog. It uses about 25% of our energy at rest. So one quarter of everything you go, you eat goes to power the like three pound thing in your head. And that's at rest. If you're trying to do something hard, like pay attention to something that's boring, for example, um, you're burning a ton of energy. So anytime you can get focus for free, it's a really big deal. You're saving a ton of energy. Peak performance, by definition, requires lots of energy. So you want to do everything you can to conserve energy along the way. When we are curious about stuff, attention comes for free. We're just interested. We're paying attention. It's not hard. We're not burning calories. We don't have to dip into willpower or grit to you know pay attention. That's a big deal. Hmm. Curiosity, though, is it's a potent motivator and it's really, really, it's actually really healthy for us in a lot of different ways, but it's not enough 
to go the long haul. Peak performance is over the long haul, right? A little bit today, a little bit tomorrow, compound interest, long haul. Um, so you are, want to start looking for the intersection of multiple curiosities. Where did two or three or four things that you're interested in overlap? Go there, learn stuff there, play there, run experiments there. That's how you start to build curiosity into passion. Um, passion is sort of the next motivator up the chain. If we were to talk about this neurobiologically, curiosity is a little bit of the neurochemical norepinephrine and a little bit of the neurochemical dopamine. These are feel-good performance-enhancing neurochemicals that drive attention into the present moment. You can get a little bit from curiosity. Passion, meanwhile, is a ton of norepinephrine and a ton of dopamine. It's a lot. And so like this is the cocktail for romantic love. You fall in love. Think about how much focus and attention you pay to the person you're falling in love with. No energy. It happens automatically, right? That's a lot of norepinephrine and a lot of dopamine. Because there is an upper threshold, we can't have too much of these neurochemicals in our system that actually starts to push us into uh, mental health challenges. Uh, mania uh, is, is too much. So is schizophrenia. So we, there's all kinds of issues if you just try to crank up the... That's why you can't just take pills, right? Because there's an upper threshold. It's uh, like most things in the body, right? There's an upper and a lower threshold and you want to sort of be in the middle. But if you want more motivation, you need more motivators. And then you that's why you want to transform passion into purpose. You simply take your passion, the thing, you, your intersection of multiple curiosities, right, that you've been cultivating, and you attach it to a cause greater than yourself, a problem in the world that really matters to you that you want to see solved. How do you take your passion and use it as a tool for good? That is how we get purpose from a peak performance standpoint. Purpose is really selfish. It's great for the world, don't get me wrong, but it's selfish. We are getting, once other people are in the equation, once we're helping other people, they're trying to help other people, we get pro-social neurochemicals, oxytocin, endorphin, serotonin. These provide further motivation. Once you have purpose, the system wants autonomy. It wants the freedom to pursue that purpose. And once you have the freedom, it wants mastery, the skills to pursue it well. Those are your big five intrinsic motivators. That's the order that they're meant to come online. And that's how you stack motivation. That's how you stack kind of mental fuel sources like you stack physical fuel sources. Man, that's just such a cool way to think about that. I think about grit and, and how that comes into play. It makes me kind of think back on Stephen Pressfield's The War of Art and the difference between a professional and an amateur. So I'm excited to ask you, a best-selling author, how, what does grit mean to you and how does that come into play? I always say grit is what you turn to when the motivation runs out, Right. It's a motivation skill, but it's really what you turn to when there's no more intrinsic motivation or extra. When you when those things have run out of fuel and your goals have stopped, run out of fuel, then you turn to grit. And I mention this because most people are kind of tough. And most people, when they run into challenges, Grit is where they reach. Like it's the first tool. Oh, fuck, this is frustrating. I'm going to tough it out. And it's the first tool we reach for. And people who are really good at this, grit is the sort of the last tool. You don't want to reach for it because if you have to be gritty for too long, it's the recipe for burnout. And that's where dreams go to die, right? So it's the last tool you want to reach for. And what the research shows is there are six sort of different kinds of grit that peak performers need to train. In the beginning, you want to train them individually just to sort of start onboarding these skills. As you get better at this, it sort of collapses together and it just becomes like this one, th this one kind of way you approach the things that you do and you don't have to train it separately at all. But in the beginning, there's six sort of six different categories of, of, of grit to train. Um, from physical grit, right? Like the, I'm going to, you know, do one more set at the gym than I normally do. There's the grit to control your thoughts. Um, this is what mindfulness is really great for. There's a uh, grit to confront fear, train weaknesses, and, and, and a couple others. And 
um, you want to start training grit. So here's something interesting. Flow is sort of the best we get to feel on the planet. It's the biggest high. It's one of the most rewarding states. It's euphoric. It's joyous. It's incredibly motivating. All of the intrinsic motivators I've just listed from curiosity through mastery, they do double duty. They also work as flow triggers. So easy way to think about it is flow is a state of total concentration. All our focus is on the task at hand. It's how all of flow's triggers work. They drive attention into the present moment. They do this. One of the ways they do this is by driving dopamine into our system. Another way is by driving norepinephrine. They work a couple other different ways, but those are two big levers that flow triggers pull because all of our big five intrinsic motivators tend to produce flow. We get all five stacked up. You tend to drop into flow more frequently and this further boosts motivation. And once you are doing that and goals, by the way, will further this cause Grit is the fourth component you start training. You don't want to start training grit regularly until the thing you're doing is regularly producing flow. The reason is if you're just trying to train grit without flow, you are going to burn out sooner or later. It's Mm. just too hard. It's too unpleasant. And it ends up being demotivating. So for example, if you've ever tried to train your weakness It is so demotivating. It's a weakness because it's the thing you suck at, right? And when you go to really train it, it's, you know, learning in general is unpleasant and and trying to learn a weakness where you have, you know, cognitive biases and all kinds of other blocks that are standing in, in your way, whatever, how your brain works, nature, nurture, stuff you can't do a whole lot about other than just sort of go slowly, it becomes really demotivating. So you don't want to deal with some of these grit skills until the shit you're doing is producing flow because it's just demoralizing and it, you, it costs you momentum and peak performance. As I keep saying, it's a little bit today. It's a little bit tomorrow. It's essentially a checklist and you don't want to cost yourself momentum. You want to, you know, save yourself momentum. It's, you know what I mean? Peak performance is about hard work, but it's about smart, hard work. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's very well said. I'd like to talk a little bit about learning and you talk about one of my favorite topics, which is the growth mindset. Can you tell the listener what the growth mindset is and how that fits in with the learning phase? Yeah, the growth mindset emerged out of Carol Dweck's research. There are, by the way, psychologists have lots of different names for the growth mindset. And um, when I think about it, I try to define it neurobiologically, like certain changes in the brain. But all that said, big preamble, (laughs) Carol Dweck defines, says, look, most people have one of two mindsets. You're either in a fixed mindset, in which case you believe talent is sort of locked up from birth. You're born with a certain level of skill. You're not going to get more. You're not going to get less. This is just the way shit is and um, live with it. A growth mindset, oh, I said, what I said is it's not, it's not just fixed. Like you're not one thing or the other. We flip back and forth. Um, but to maximize flow and to maximize learning, you can't, it's very difficult to learn anything without a growth mindset. It essentially blocks learning. And um, there's a lot of correlation between a growth mindset and flow for the simple reason that you need a lot of like present tense focus for flow. And if you don't have a growth mindset and you make a mistake doing whatever it is you're doing, you'll dwell on it. You'll be like, oh shit, I made a mistake. I was not as good as I thought I was. And I, I suck. And right. But if you've got a growth mindset, you're like, oh, I made a mistake. But the next time I'm here, I'm not going to make that mistake again. And suddenly your attention is back on the present and you end up having more flow over time and greater learning. So if you want, like I always say that, you know, learning is foundational for peak performance. And there's a couple of prerequisites for learning. Right before you ready, before you're ready to learn, a couple things matter, and one of them is a growth mindset. I love that. I, I it's also referred to as the yet mentality, and I think that was really helpful for me as I was learning this skill early on. And it's just like saying, like, yeah, like you're starting a business, you might not ha- know how to do accounting yet, but you can learn. Like there, there's skills that you can go out and learn, and just because you don't, you know, have them now doesn't mean you won't have them tomorrow. And, and in that way, it becomes so much more empowering. I think. The thing that I want to point out that people miss here, because it's, and there's not enough work on this, the research is murky, but it's very, it's very true. 
So when, when you were talking about any of these skills, grit skills, growth mindset, any of that stuff, you have to constantly remind yourself. It's not enough to sort of work on these skills and like gritty, right? I'm going to go out every day and I'm going to do a, do a hike with a heavy weight vest. And every day I'm going to, every day this month, I'm going to hike five minutes longer than I hiked yesterday, right? That's something I would do to train grit, for example. It's not enough to do that every day for a month. At the end of the month, you have to remind yourself what you've done. You've got to look back and be like, oh, wow, I was extra gritty five minutes a day for this entire month. Look, I must be gritty. Oh, look, I'm actually, you have to believe you not only have to train the grit, then you have to remind yourself that you have it. The same thing with a growth mindset. Um, and the other thing that I always tell people to guard against is, if you have a job that demands you be an expert, accountants have jobs that demand they be an expert, right? When you call your accountant, you don't want them to be a little off on the numbers. Same thing with lawyers. They have to be experts all the time. When I'm on stage giving a talk, I'm an expert. When, after you're done being an expert, your brain is in a fixed mindset. It produces a fixed mindset. And this is why if you, you know, if you sort of, interrogate me right after a speech i'm going to defend my turf like an expert but if we were just having a conversation you interrogated me in the same way i'm probably going to be like oh yeah i see where you're coming from and this is there's this factor and this factor and this factor and this factor i'm no longer in a growth mind i'm in a fixed mindset i'm in a growth mindset exploratory learning that sort of thing i'm not defending my territory that is super interesting. That makes a lot of sense. I want to be really deliberate with this phrase, as deliberate as you were. What are the five not so easy steps for learning almost everything? I think it's great. Or I'm sorry, <laughs> still goofed it up. Learning almost anything. There's nothing quick about this process. So I like, I'm a little like, I'm happy to answer that question. I'm going to try to do it as quickly as possible, but I haven't done a good job of it so far. I just want you to know that. <laughs> no, that's totally fine. And that's a great so, way to even answer that question is that but, this is a so process. Let me, yeah, it is a great way to answer that question. Let me, let me just walk people through this. When it comes to learning, there's two things you're going to learn, skills and knowledge. So the five steps to learning almost anything is about knowledge acquisition more than skill acquisition. Um, there's a different, either in the, in our Muslim, I talk about a different approach to skill acquisition, but it's um, the five, I, it starts with the five books of stupid, which are basically the first five books you need to read to get acquainted with a subject and five is a very, it's a specific number for a specific reason. And it's your sort of, gateway into a subject there's an order there's a kind of book there's there's details there we're not going to go there right now we can go back there if you want to um this next sec set of the next step is about how to once you've kind of learned the basics of a subject now it's time to go sort of find and talk to experts and the next step is about how to have those discussions with experts the third step is when you get to this point in learning knowledge, like you've got a baseline kind of foundation from those big, the five sort of foundational books you've read. Now you've talked to experts, which are you basically kind of read five books. You got a bunch of questions. You talk to experts to get your answers. And what you're going to start to notice is that there are gaps between your questions. There's like you have an answer to your left and an answer to your right. And there's a gap in between. Um, a lot of expertise sits in those gaps and there's a lot of great sort of learning inside those gaps. And then step four is a way to continue to interrogate your subject. And step five is a way to take everything you just learned and turn it into a narrative, a story of sorts. And the reason you want to do this, the last step is the brain is a storytelling machine. It's built to link cause with effect um, at a really foundational level. So if you can turn some, if you can do all the steps to learn it and then turn it into a story, you're going to store all that information forever and it's going to lock in. So those are, that's a really high level overview as the fastest I've ever done it, but that's sort of the, the five not so easy steps for learning anything. 
That's great. No, that's awesome. I definitely highly recommend any of the listeners go and buy the book because it explains this in a lot more detail. And I really appreciate the high level answer. I'm curious if you can give a brief um, practical example of what that story might look like. So I'll give you the simplest one. And this is everybody's got their own, but I like. So we started this interview and I did that. I did this thing to you. You asked a, you asked a hard question about flow. And I said, well, let me do this historically. Flow science is 150 years old. And I walk you through that story. It's a narrative. And because it's a narrative, because I, in my brain, I, flow science and really all I like, I do this. I, when I was in college, I was very fortunate. I was in the university of Wisconsin. They have a fabulous world-renowned interdisciplinary history of science court uh, discipline there. And I took a ton of classes in there. Um, in general, I learned to think about science historically as a voyage of discovery. Somebody had a question. It led to another question. It led to another question. It led to another question. And that's the narrative. That's the freaking story. So as long as I know, you know, oh, in the 1890s, they were asking these kinds of questions, I can pretty much piece together and tell you in a coherent fashion the answer to any question you might ask me that like falls anywhere in that history of neuroscience. Does that make any sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. It allows me to kind of follow along with that journey in my imagination. Okay, so let me, let me, let me, let me take it one other way. You've heard of memory palaces? No, I haven't. Okay, so. In when the ancient Greeks wanted to memorize like four hour speeches that the philosophers would give, they would do it by building a memory palace. And a memory palace is you take a structure that is very familiar to your house and you start by walking in your front door. And as you walk in your front door, you put an image in your mind that's associated with the front door, usually very oversized and dramatic, something weird. But that represents a block, uh, the first block of your speech. And then you walk in your house and you look to your left and you see a closet, say, and the closet door is the second element in your speech and so forth. You build. And the reason this works is memory predominantly starts in the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is a part of the brain that was designed evolutionarily to map location. We're hunter gatherers. So as hunter gatherers, we move from environment to environment to environment to environment. And what are we what are we tracking? We're tracking food, right? So in certain seasons, we have to know where are the deer going to be, where are the rabbits going to be, where's the ripe oranges, where are the ripe persimmons, where are the root vegetables, blah, 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 that sort of thing. We have to map locations. And so when the brain does learning and memory and when the brain does most of its neurogenesis, the creation of new neurons that lead to learning and memory, it starts in the hippocampus and it starts with these places, these locations, and they, they can be locations in space or locations in time. Those are narratives the brain is very comfortable with. So that's sort of how I think about these things. Wow, interesting. I actually have heard of that technique. Isn't this how people who win memory contests are able to memorize like all of the numbers of pi or something? They do that same kind of process? Yes, exactly. Mm, exactly. Any, 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 uh, most of the memory stuff is built out of these things. And of course, like this is why peak performance is nothing more than getting our biology to work for us rather than against us, right? It, like when you take it down, I always said the advantage with neuroscience is this. Psychology is an incredibly useful tool, and it allows us to talk about really hard shit that is really important to our quality of our life. But if you want to make things reliable, repeatable, works for everybody, works in every situation, you need neuroscience because psychology is metaphor, useful metaphor, but metaphor. Neuroscience is mechanism. It's reliable, repeatable. It works across the boards. So this is the same thing. Like you want memory, learning and memory. Well, understand that learning and memory starts in the hippocampus. This is also why, by the way, um, you see like uh, one of the things that's most neuroprotective against cognitive decline in older adults action sports are really good for this because you're moving through natural environments. And at adventure sports too, or hiking in the outside, anything outdoors where you're moving through natural environments and sort of getting occasionally lost um, is really, really neuroprotective against cognitive decline as we age. Same reason. Interesting. 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about creativity. And my question is not only how do we develop creativity, but how are we able to maintain it over the course of our entire lives? Ah, you're asking the million dollar question. Um, so creativity, high level. I always say that like, you know, my interest is in how like has helping people to go after, you know, high goals, difficult things that are hard to get to. We don't quite, we know where we are. We know where we want to go. We don't know what the route is and we've got bad odds of success. How do we improve those odds of success? Well, creativity is how we steer, right? It's the mechanism that allows us to steer through life and Interestingly, we have learned a great deal about the kind of neurobiology of creativity. And most of that work has focused on, okay, I'm working on a creative project. I'm writing a book or I'm doing a, a report for school or, you know, an architectural design or a landscape or I'm building a house or whatever it is, single project creativity. But in the 21st century, creativity has been shown again and again and again. To be, it's the number one skill we need to thrive in the 21st century. This is for kids in school. This is for CEOs of Fortune 100 companies. It's the most important skill in the 21st century. Basically, it's how we keep space with radically accelerating technology, right? And what matters here is not just in the moment creativity, but what I call long haul creativity. How do you maintain creativity over a lifetime? And Certainly, you know, there's all kinds of research that shows there was research done uh, um, on millennials. I don't know. It's got to be greater for Gen Z's. But I think it said the average millennial is going to have four different careers before they're 35. Wow. (laughs) Think about that for a second. Right. So my point is, you know, when I look at like the people I admire the, the most are people who have reinvented themselves over and over and over and over again. And they're still true to exactly who they are, but they have managed to kind of stay relevant, stay current. And and how do you do that? How do you maintain long haul creativity was, was a core question. So there's no real research that's been done on this formally. Um, There is, there's sort of longitudinal studies that look at, Oh, historical genius. And these are the commonalities and this sort of stuff. I have spent 10 years interviewing eminent creatives and I just sort of distilled um, long haul creativity down into um, nine. There's nine different bits of advice for kind of maintaining long haul creativity. And they're, they sort of are all over the place. We can sort of go anywhere here, but um, the thing that I, the high level thing that I, that I'll say before we I'll let you go deeper, but um, is A lot of the stuff that you need to be creative in the moment is not, it's different than what you need to be creative over the long haul. And that's one of the reasons creativity can be tricky over the long haul, because some of the stuff that you need for in the moment creativity is different than what you need for long haul creativity. And you're going to have to sort of learn to switch back and forth and cultivate both sets of skills. Interesting. So maybe we could talk about this. You mentioned people that you admire and how they were able to flow with this over time. Maybe you could come up with, you know, one person and give one example of how they were able to be creative in the long haul. I just tell one story from the book. um, And it's about uh, somebody who I admired deeply, um, Sir Ken Robinson, who is one of the world's leading experts on creativity, a very, very nice, funny, good, good, smart guy. Um, who I was lucky enough to spend a little bit of time around. And, you know, one of the world's leading experts on creativity. So, of course, I had to talk to him about long-haul creativity. And he said something interesting. And he he said, you know, I think if you're talking about long-haul creativity, you need a sort of low-grade, near-constant dissatisfaction frustration with your finished products. And I, I, I asked him for an example, and he told me a story about George Lucas. So apparently Ken met George Lucas, and he popped the question. Like, he asked Lucas the question that you're not ever supposed to ask George Lucas, but Ken Robinson did in his charming way. And he said, you know, hey, George, why do you keep remaking all those Star Wars movies? <laughs> Great question. And Lucas's answer was, in this particular universe, I'm God. And God isn't satisfied. And 
so the reason I mentioned that story is I, I always say that to me, how do you know you're dealing with like a real creative, an actual artist? To me, the, the number one giveaway, the tell is when they finish a creative project, are they showing off the thing they just did or are they on to the next thing? Because true creatives are in it for the actual creativity. It's sort of like self-preservation, mental health, joy, self-experience, all of that wrapped together. And they're always on to the next thing. They're never like, it's never about, oh, I wrote this thing. You know what I mean? I, I did this thing already. It's always the next thing. And one of the things that I think propels you to the next thing is this constant sort of dissatisfaction. Mm. Um, you know what I mean? Like I look back on my 14 books and I've got my favorites, but let's be clear what I mean by favorite. It's like, those are the books that I can read the longest before, like the mistakes I've made annoy me so much that I hurl them across the room in frustration. <laughs> wow. Right. Like that's really sort of what you're talking about. Um, with a lot, with a lot of those books, um, which, you know, is great, right? Like the good news is most of you guys, when, or gals, when you read the books, don't notice. I notice and I want to fix them. So I want to write the next one. Mm. Wow, that's interesting. It just reminds me of the stoic practice of dichotomy of control. It's like you can control what words you put in that book, but once you release the book out into the world, well, the book's going to do what it's going to do. I, you know, I teach, I, run, I do a class called Flow for Writers and I like it's a digital class now. It used to be live. I probably trained I mean, most like thought leaders who have written a book in the past five years, I've trained so many of them. So many books have come out of local writers <clears throat> and we spend a little bit of time sort of right here on this, on this very point and, and, and making the point that you just said, because I think it's important. So let's talk about flow itself. I, I'm, I've been trying to figure out how to phrase this question, but is, is flow just linear to, to more benefit the more I'm in it? Or is there kind of a, a cap or a, a, a time when we're in the flow state too much and can, it could be detrimental? Interesting, hard question. Really interesting, really hard question. So first of all, you can't, Flow is a four-stage process, right? So there's no, you're not permanently in flow. Um, that That's not possible. The other thing is flow is this really big high. It's useful for a ton of stuff, but there's a bunch of stuff it's not great for. For example, when we're in flow, long-term planning and really logical linear decision-making are really, really, really sort of turned off. So is morality, for that matter, really dialed down in flow. Flow tends to increase empathy over time. But in the actual moment, like, you know, a lot of the early work on flow was done on flow in soldiers and flow in war. And depending on which side of the conflict you're on, you know what I mean? Like good or bad. So um, flow itself is a neutral tool for peak performance. Um, it's useful for certain things. It's not useful for others. And ultimately, like, I think for flow to really like work its magic as a, as, as a motivator, you sort of want in a, in a weird way, a lot of time, you know, want time out of flow, besides the fact that there's stuff you have to do out of flow. Like it's the contrast between what normal life feels like and the ex ecstasy of flow that makes the state so addictive. So that's really important too. And um, the other, the, there are downsides to flow. So for example, I ran a seven month experiment this year that uh, had me in flow probably more as much uh, as I've ever spent in my entire life. That experiment ended on May 27th. And I was near suicidal for all of June. Wow. Because the, there's a hangover afterwards. Like what goes up must come down. And this like I so much flow. It's there's a dark side to flow. And you know, you're talking to a guy who, like, you know, I'm I'm good at this stuff. I know what <laughs> I'm doing. Right. Like I expected the low, but like. I, I was laughing at myself and I was actually talking to a, 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 one of the psychologists 
uh, who works at the Flow Research Collective about it. And I was I was laughing. I was like, it just doesn't matter. It's like, you know, there's a part of one of the reasons flow so improves quality of life and overall well-being and meaning and purpose and all that stuff is it shuts down the brain so you don't think about all the other stuff that's you know occupying cognitive load and all the scary stuff in the world whatever and you drop out of flow there's no more feel good happy neurochemistry and suddenly all that kind of acknowledgement of the stuff you've sort of been using flow that, that's been blocked out while you've been in flow um it'll come it comes back of course and you know it, it it'll rock you <laughs> no wow. way around it that's uh there's cool. also uh there's also this is another thing this has to do with uh Flow tends to show up the most, it's one of most flow's most important triggers basically says when we're using our skills to the utmost. So you're sort of pushing on your skills. You're always slightly outside your comfort zone. You're always sort of stretching to the, towards the edge of your abilities. Over time, what happens is your appetite for risk continues to increase, it goes up and up and up and up and up and up. And that happens automatically at the time spent in flow. So you our your appetite for risk will increase over time. This, if not managed properly, can cause a lot of problems. Mm. That makes so much sense. I remember hearing you recently in an interview describe a 100-foot chute that you were skiing down with basically cliffs on either side where you didn't have space to make a turn. And yeah, I would hope... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Listen to me. That was pencil shoot. That was maybe the scariest thing I've ever done on skis. <laughs> Dude, it's I... It's a 75-foot straight line, oh. um, which means you're between... 30 foot lava walk walls that are like, you can reach out and touch there on either side of you. And um, straight lines are just hard. They've always, they're hard for me. You go in this shoot, you go, you're zero to 50. There's, you know, there's nowhere. By the time you exit, you're moving at 50 miles an hour and the exit is blind. Oh, yeah. I pooped hearing that story for sure. That's crazy. Um, but yeah, in that situation, you would want to be there in the moment and not necessarily planning your next book. You and planning your next book is going to get you killed, right? Yep. Yeah, exactly. So, wow, interesting. Yeah. Exactly. Are, are there situations in life where we simply need to reallocate our attention to put flow where it belongs? Like, let's say I'm staying up and playing, you know, Call of Duty all night long. Could I, should I rearrange my life and the things that I do so I can I can just reallocate flow states to other parts of my life that might be more beneficial? So now, first of all, video games produce a lot of flow. Now, right, flow is it just it can be used for good or for ill. We know there's a lot of cognitive benefits for video from video games. So they're not useless activities. They there's real actual cognitive skills that are trained up by playing Call of Duty all night. That said, um, if Call of Duty is like if you're saying, hey man, I shouldn't be playing Call of Duty all night. I would say you got to go back to motivation and goal setting and like get those things lined up so that the urge to play Call of Duty all night fades, replaced by something that takes you close, you know, farther towards something you want to go to. So I want to like sort of start there. Does that make any sense? Yeah, makes perfect sense. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I like if you're a professional video game player, then exactly what you want to do is play Call of Duty all night, right? Right. Right. If you're, if you're not and you're trying to get work done, yeah, but like, I don't like it's like there's a lot of flow in Call of Duty. There's a lot of feel good neurochemicals in video games are your thing. They're not my thing. You know what I mean? I like video games never drop me into flow. It doesn't work that way for me. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, there, I, I'm, I'm in a state of absorption for sure. You know what I mean? But like, it's, it's not flow. Gotcha. Um, and you know, one of the ways I always tell, like, here's the example I always give people when you're done, when I'm done playing, like, I remember, uh, I, it's been a while since I played a video game, but, uh, doom and mist both sucked me in. <laughs> I walked away from neither of them. Did I walk away? Like when I walk away from a day skiing and I'm in flow, I am happy. I feel great on top world. When I walked away from doom or mist, I sort of like felt low grade agitated and drained. Sort of like when I walk away from like watching too much television and 
Right. So like that's absorption. That's not flow. Totally different thing. Wow. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm, I'm with you. I find that most activities where I feel that same way, really happy after I did it and realize I was, you know, in a flow state is usually in nature, usually moving. Um, I, I find it more on my mountain bike than I do my road bike, although I love them both. It's just, it, it's a thing that I think you access more in nature, more maybe with other people, that kind of thing. Well, it's a state that you access mm. more in nature and more with other people. Now there are a bunch of flow triggers that show up in nature and like all that stuff. Like there's a reason, but there's like, it's because from a personality standpoint, you're wired in a particular way, right? More in nature means you're really wired for novelty, mm. not right. And if you were road bikers, for example, they tend to ride in pain into flow, endorphins into flow, um, exhaustion into flow more than say mountain bikers who are more playing games with risk and novelty. Mm. I'm not saying road biking isn't dangerous. It scares the hell out of me. I'm (laughs) much happier on a downhill mountain bike (laughs) than anywhere. Like I don't traffic freaks me out, man. And those tires are too skinny. And like, I'm not like, it's not my thing. (laughs) <laughs> totally. Yeah. I mean, most people think mountain biking is more dangerous, but yeah, I would much rather run into a tree than, than have, you know, a, a giant well, truck. I'll give, you an, I'll give you another example. Like for me, cross country, which is not my thing is much more dangerous than DH mm. because I'm not a cross country rider. I'm a gravity athlete. I like to go down and, you know, I've got a t-shirt that says life is too short to go uphill. <laughs> or as I, you know, I, all the only time I go uphill on a bike or on like hiking with my skis on my back is when there's not a chair left to take me. Wow. Um, <laughs> but I mean, as you know, if you've ever done any DH riding, D, DH is so much more intense than, than riding cross country. Like it just, it's down is so much harder than up. Totally. But um, I will screw myself up on up so much more. Literally, like, you've never seen a dude, like, wreck so badly, failing to go, you know, to around a corner, because, like, I just hate the up, and I can't focus, and I can't stay, like, I can't do what I'm supposed to do, um, and it just doesn't work for me, and then I get to the top, and I got to go down, and um, I'm not, like, I'm in the wrong frame of mind. It's a disaster for me. It's ridiculous. <laughs> wow. That's so interesting. Steven, this is so funny. An, I mean, it's, 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 well, you're right. It was such a great point that just because I feel it one way, they, these are very highly individualized and nuanced kind of states of being. And and it, your work is so interesting. Well, it's, just, but it's all the other thing you got to remember is it's super nuanced states of being for you as well. You know what I mean? Like if you wake up and you're super tired and you don't have a lot of energy, and you like. For example, if you wake, if I wake up and I'm in a really bad, mad mood and I need to fix my mood, right? And flow is a pretty fast, quick fix. I'm not going to go trying to go ride my DH mountain bike. Or if I take out my skis, for example, I'm going to stay on green and blue trails for a really long time because I don't want much novelty. I don't want much risk at that point because I'm so tired and like beleaguered just like simple exercise and you know that's the better choice to get into flow for that day based on you know the challenge skills balance and a bunch of other triggers kind of thing so it we vary as well mm. and yeah. we vary over the course of our lifetime mm. as well wow wow that's a great point this has been an amazing conversation steven um where would you like people to go to find you and to find your work um you can find me at stephencotler.com. You could find the uh, Flow Research Collective, our trainings, a bunch of free videos and inf- information, our podcast, etc. at flowresearchcollective.com. And I'm all over social media, though I can't guarantee you're actually getting me. 
But well, sometimes you are, and I try. But sometimes <laughs> you're getting other people, and I just like to be truthful about that. <laughs> <laughs> you're totally fine. I know your time is in much demand, and we're so grateful for it today. Stephen Kotler, best-selling author, uh, latest book called The Art of Impossible, which I highly, highly recommend. Thank you so much for all of your work, for your research, and for putting it out into the world so all of us can benefit and learn from everything that you've been able to learn and distill down in a very simple and practical way. So, Stephen Kotler, thank you so very much for everything you do, and thank you for appearing today on Balanced Body Radio. We'll do something with the work. That's how you say thank you. And uh, I appreciate you. Awesome. I will get busy doing something with the work. That sounds great. Thanks again. And this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio.